All right, we are recording. Welcome, everyone. This is Juan Soto. I'm the uh, chapter president of the uh, Access with SQL Server Group, uh, accessusergroups.org. I'd like to welcome everyone from around the world. We've got George Hepworth, who's the uh, chapter president for Access Pacific. George, say hi. I have to unmute. Hi. Good to see you all. All right. Hi. And uh, we've got uh, Klaus from uh, Europe, who's a, a faithful participant of these meetings every every month. Appreciate you, Klaus. Klaus, for <laughs> joining us. A bit late, but uh, okay. I'm I'm okay with it. <laughs> no worries. And uh, today, uh, before we can start with the main topic, I got a couple of notes for you guys. So one of the things that I uh, wanted to discuss is um, we had another access bug that was pretty nasty that um, got uh, people locked out of their access system. Only one person can look on, connect them at once. And uh, it's a real shame that we get through these issues. Uh, most of my clients were not affected because most of our clients are using SQL Server backend. And uh, it really is uh, been a real t saver for us because over the years we've had these bugs happen over the years where um, the uh, office team will issues a security update and ends up ends up messing the uh, Max product. But if you're using SQL Server as a backend, you're fine. So it's just um, I'm hopefully you guys have. And you will see the blog post. I will be blogged about it. I, ben Claudio has blogged about it. How to resolve these issues, and hopefully you've been able to overcome them. All right. So um, one of the things that uh, uh, sorry, but I think in uh, 2019 the bug is not fixed. In 2019. Uh, yeah, as far as I heard from my customers. Version. Correct. Only the 365 version has been fixed so far. Oh, is that right? I, I thought see. it was. I, I thought that every, everything had received a partial fix. No. Well, the last information I got is that it's still pending release on 2019, but do you, you know anything different, George? You want to chime in there? No, I, I, I haven't been following it that closely. I know I. I mean, the, it, it, I, I just. I, for some reason, I thought the 2019 patch had been released, and that's not, but you know. Yeah. Well, you don't let's have the bug any longer? Because well, I heard from my. It's, it's, still not, it's still not fixed on the, on the retail version. Oh, okay. That's what it is. Yeah. I saw something today that indicated there are some that are pending the next release in the next few days. Uh, Let me look this up because I saw something from Shane. Yeah, that's on the, the access team recently, and uh, I was just reading through his email, and let's see here. Yeah, I mean everything I've heard so far is that the uh, the fix is being released as soon as possible for all versions. Um, we'll get the uh, and the update the update we get for twenty eighteen VL and twenty twenty one VI. The yeah, we got the January 11th, which is today. Uh, oh, okay. I just, yeah. I just, found, so I just looks, found Shane's latest uh, post from about two hours ago. Yeah. It says version 2102 is semi-annual enterprise channel extended, has not been updated yet. Okay. And that was as of what? This is two and a half, a little over two hours ago. So, yeah. But there is a workaround for that. It says you can move to version 2108, which is the current semi annual enterprise channel. Mm -hmm. And that should fix it. But, it, it, you know, it, the problem from my perspective is there's so many versions and so many options that, yeah, that they're all different. Well, and that and the and the fact is that the access team is not in control of its destiny, right? You have so many moving parts in the office uh, to the point where you've got a team for access, you got a team for Excel, you got a team for Word. There's another team that's in charge of VBA, believe it or not. And uh, I've only met the only met those guys once, 
And I think George was still an MVP back then. George, you remember a session where we had a chance to meet the VBA guy, project yep. manager? Pro- yeah, manager, I, yeah, I think that was my last summit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was the last time I saw those guys, too, by the way. And every year they asked me for topics that we want to discuss at the MVP Summit. And I, every year I say, I'd like to meet with the VBA guys, see what they're up to. Because, you know, honestly, I don't see any changes in VBA. And um, we hit them really hard. I'm not supposed to talk about what we, we said at this, uh, the MVP Summit or something, but it wasn't pretty. Let's put it that way. No. Uh, and... Um, I think he, <laughs> that was the day he was wore off ever coming to an MVP summit <laughs> with the Axis team because the Axis MVPs can be quite vocal. I, you know, I, and again, there's only so much I can say about what happens in the summit, but um, it's uh, it was not pretty. And so I can uh, confirm that. <laughs> and so um, you've got uh, folks at the uh, uh, Microsoft who are in charge of releasing security updates. And those guys messed up access by mistake. And now you've got these issues worldwide where people are, are uh, not just not be able to get in. And let me tell you, all this stuff is just hurts access image and just prompts people to say, you know what, the, the hell with this, I'm gonna go and go use web apps or something else or competing products, right? Or something because it just really upsets. And you know, um, one of the things I've learned over the years is how much access is used in Europe. I mean, the European conferences for Microsoft Access that uh, Carl handles, and you can go to DevCom, I think I think it's DevCom Vienna, you can look search for that, DEV Vienna, you'll get to his website. Um, those, those, those sessions are packed with 200 people. I could never get 200 people in the States. If I did a free conference in Chicago, and I had a lineup of speakers uh, from here to the end of the block that were just amazing. I'd be happy if I get 100 people. But he, he managed to pack 200 people in these access conferences. And access is pretty huge in Europe. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that I love about Europe also is they're very cutting edge in terms of how they can, how they uh, really put the products in spaces. It's just amazing the kind of the, the stuff that that occurs. And, uh, you know, when I present, I have a philosophy of I like to uh, tickle the mind, if you will, and talk about these topics. I don't get into the weeds of code. You're never going to see me do a session here uh, in this chapter where I go through a hundred line piece of black of code and I explain exactly what's happening. But that's what you get in those conferences. And I made a mistake once of presenting in Europe and um, it was not pretty. I got some terrible reviews and, and Carl, God bless him, he calls me later and he says, you know what, I'm gonna have to drop you for next year because it's just the reviews were just terrible. And I thought it was entertaining, I thought I'd knock it out of the park and then it turns out that they were looking for more technical and deep technical discussions. And I just have a philosophy where in an hour and a half, am I really gonna be able to teach you some esoteric technique in terms of access? I'd rather take the hour and a half and point you in the right direction, like a, like somebody who's pointing an arrow, let the arrow find its target. That's always been my philosophy. That and to make these things entertaining because let's face it, it's 6.30 p.m. and uh, Central Standard Time, you've already had dinner, you, you're, you're probably going through a carb coma to coma uh, after having dinner or you're, or you're hungry and you haven't had dinner or you haven't had dinner as you're talking to me. And, um, you know, I need to make these things entertaining because it's uh, it's important to me that you come back month after month. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'm doing right now is I'm in the Caribbean, came down here. My wife was fortunate enough to retire a year ago, and we bought this home. And behind me, I'm in the living room, and they had these uh, <laughs> these drapes. I call it the Presidential Palace. I'm actually live from the Presidential Palace in Puerto Rico, transmitting live. <laughs> Uh, from uh, behind the security grates. And uh, either that or I'm in prison and I was able to put, uh, scrounge up some some linen so that uh, it looks nice in my prison cell. But, uh, you know, I'm here through March and, um, and uh, you know, I, I, my clients say, you all envy me and they say, I don't want, I wish I was down there. I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I'm glad. But it, it took all these years though, you know, my wife worked for 30 years and we finally retired and now she's been able to 
to um, and I can join her anywhere because I can do this job anywhere in the world. But it's uh, eight thirty p.m. here instead of six thirty, so uh, it's quite dark and and I've been waiting all evening to get this chat started. Um, but uh, we're here now, and today's topic is how to convince your client or your boss or someone to migrate to SQL Server. And this is uh, a topic that I think is going to lead be a little salesy. Right, because there is, uh, I do this for a living. It's, I convince people to migrate access to SQL Server as, as a sales director at IT Impact. And um, I'm going to lean into some of my techniques and how to uh, do that. And it's a great discussion, uh, especially in light of all these issues that Access has been having with the batch of patches that, uh, that could have been avoided if your database were on SQL Server. Doncall.com. Thank you, Carl. There it is in the chat. So there's uh, there's ongoing comments in the chat. Please open the chat and windows. Klaus. So the... Klaus. I'm not Carl. Klaus. Yes, I know. Thank you, Klaus, for uh, for uh, that. Uh, don't call. No, no uh, you Carl. said Carl. Yeah, I, I I mispronounced it. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. But I know your problems uh, with the team. Once, uh, when I was uh, MVP, I was uh, in in Seattle as well, and and the uh, uh, what I have seen was mixed. There, the information, you don't get very much information from them. That was at that time my feeling. Yeah, and, you know, and uh, when I first I became MVP, I also didn't get a lot of information. Then we had some really good program project program managers for a couple of years and uh, it was like a spigot open and we got all kinds of information. Now I'm on the fence as to uh, whether we're better off or not because uh, this new program manager is also responsible for a whole different area and he's sharing responsibilities. And I can see already that, uh, you know, it's, uh, I can see the impact on that in terms of communication. But uh, I'm hoping that, um, the access team can spring back from these issues and uh, have a great 2022. But you know, hope spring is eternal when they come in here and access MVP. So it's a nice topic. We're going to talk more about how to convince people to move to SQL Server and why would people not move to SQL Server, right? What is the hesitancy? Well, there's several reasons. Number one, it's not cheap. You got to spend a lot of time optimizing the access. I have somebody here. On this call is actually one of my clients. I'm not going to say who it is, but it's not cheap to move over because it takes a lot of time, especially if you have a very complex program with uh, lots of forms, tables, and queries. It takes a lot of time to move into SQL Server. There's just no if, buts, or ands about it. It takes a lot of work to optimize access to work with SQL Server. And that's one of the reasons why you guys show up here every night, every month after month. And read my blog post and uh, learn more how to optimize access with SQL Server. Uh, it's a lot of effort. It does pay off. I always say it's worth always worth the while, right? But it is a lot of work, and a business that's struggling financially may not have the resources to do that. <clears throat> now, that's number one. Number two, one of, uh, another reason why they uh, don't want this, they, they associate SQL Server, sometimes they associate SQL Server with the cloud. And they don't want their data in the cloud. Like, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times people say, I don't want my data in the cloud, right? And, and I've always had this example. I always give this example about um, once I met somebody who was really adamant about that and I offered to cut their internet wires. And, um, you know, they just don't want to be in the cloud, right? And uh, which is a misnomer because if you have internet, you're already in the cloud, right? The fact that you have a public IP address, if you open the browser right now and type in whatismyip.com, it'll tell you your public IP address. So everybody's got a public IP address in the world right now who's connected to the internet. And that public IP address is translating to the private IP address once it gets to your uh, modem at your home. So if you have five PCs in your house, cell phones, tablets, PCs, they all have internal IP addresses. But all five of those devices, all 10, in my case, I have dozens of devices because I have Apple TV. I've got TVs that are smart. I've got printers. I've got, I've got, I probably got anywhere between 20 and 30 devices, not including the home security stuff that, uh, 
all is represented by that single IP address, right? What is my IP.com? And so when you tell me as a business, you don't want to be on the internet, that's the misnomer. You're already on the internet. And if you have that crappy Comcast modem that Comcast gives you as your firewall, or AT&T Business gives you as your firewall, those modems, uh, those gateways are well known. Those uh, flaws and those zero day flaws that they have are well known and they're very hackable and you got to be careful, right? If you're if your business is uh, relying on that as your firewall, that's another thing I always tell people. Make sure you have a man professionally managed firewall for your business. And so what other reasons besides those people will have to not go to SQL Server? The other aspect of this is they don't want to get a server for their home, for their for their either home network or their business network. They just don't want to go through the houses of buying a server. Right now, when they ask me, um, when they ask me, Juan, what kind of server should I get? I tell them, get the server that fits your budget. If you got a thousand dollar budget, get a thousand dollar server. If you got a five thousand dollar budget, get a five thousand dollar server. The better the, the, the server, the better off you're going to be. But any server you buy, it's better than no server at all, right? So when I come across clients who have a 5PC network and uh, they want to use SQL Server because I convince them, they say, well, we don't, I tell them, the first thing I ask them is, do you have a server now? And he says, no, we don't have a server right now. We're using this um, attached storage device that they get at uh, Best Buy. Uh, and they use that as their server, and it's really a device that you can't install any, you can't install a SQL Server or Express on it, right? And so um, the discussion comes into play as well. And, you know, you really should get a server, and these are the reasons why. And how much does it cost me? And uh, and and uh, you know, what? I'll tell them, look, you know, it, it costs you as as little as much as you can afford, but get a server. And these days, the servers are not that expensive. You can probably get a good server for $1,000 or $1,500. You know, let's, let's think about it. You've got a PC, a network of five PCs. They currently don't have a server. Any server you get is going to be 100% improvement what they have now, right? Now, what I do not advocate for them to do is install a single server on a really old server, Windows 2000 server that's not no longer supported. I, I tell them, you know, you gotta get a server. I mean, it's just too old. And then I tell them, look, if you don't want a server, then you should use a cloud service. Either use our cloud service, we host people's data, some of our clients' data, and our own cloud server, our own cloud in Azure, or they can sign up for Azure and uh, go through that uh, hassle of signing up for for Azure and getting this uh, SQL, using a SQL service. Either way, um, it, uh, it avoids having the server. So those are the main reasons why someone may not want to go to SQL Server, right? There's, there are gonna be some additional reasons, but there's my reason. Now let's talk about why they should be on SQL Server. One of the reasons is performance. It's going back to back to the analogy of the network with SQL, with five SQL. I said, I said five in, in Spanish, SQL. Those five PCs have been have been around Puerto Rico here. It was since uh, March, January first, so I mean December first. So I've been here for a month and a half already. But if you have five PCs and one of them crashes, right, and they're using all the same front end, they're all going to crash right off the bat, right? Every single one of those PCs, because a lot of people make the mistake of using one front end file on the network to run it and then when one crashes everybody crashes but if one crashes and they all have front ends on their pc they may or may not all crash or they may or may not corrupt data but when you have your data in sql server and somebody crashes it's not going to affect sql server that data is not going to affect what's going to be affected is any any record they've added that has not yet been committed back to the server or any record they've edited that's not been committed to that server. So if I'm in the middle of editing a record, a customer record, a sale or or an invoice, and I haven't saved that record yet to the server, I've lost my changes. But I'm not gonna crash the whole system. I'm not gonna crash SQL Server. I'm not gonna crash my co my coworkers. So one of the reasons why you should go to SQL Server is that the ability to avoid crashes. The second reason why you would want to go to SQL Server, I'm gonna leave the best reason for last, by the way. 
Second reason why you should move to SQL Server is, before, is because you can put a lot more people on it. And I always make the analogy when you go from access to the SQL Server, it's like you're going from a bicycle to a car. There's just no comparison. I've had clients, believe it or not, that have used an access, hundreds of users on a network using access as their front end with SQL Server in the back end. And that would have never happened if it was a purely access solution. I'm lucky if I can get 25 people. Uh, George, how many people have you ever gotten to use access as a pure access solution? I've gotten up to 25 people. It's not, it's not pretty, but it works. I think the largest was probably around a dozen. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's pushing it. It's pushing it. You're running into slowness issues. You're running into performance issues because access was never designed to handle a large amount of people. And there's some things that you can do to make away 25, but it's a lot of work. And I really don't buy on doing that anymore because I could use. I always said SQL Server Express was the best thing that ever happened to access, right? And so when that came along. And before that, and I keep forgetting the name of it, before the SQL Server Express, there was a name for that SQL Server that you installed that was free. I think it was the desktop, the SQL Server, SQL Desktop Engine or anything. But now they re, well, they rebranded SQL Server Express. I always said that's the best thing ever happened to access. And so um, you can get a lot of users. Now, I've never gone past 200 users with SQL Server because once you get to that many users, 200, 300 users, you're better off using the web app, honestly. If you've got two or 300 users using a Microsoft Access application, you're just better off just buying the bullet and start converting it over to a web app. I've got a customer on Denver that's approaching that uh, upper barrier, and uh, we already start talking about taking some parts of the application, the most used parts of the application, and creating a web app with those web pages to be able to handle some departments. So some of the departments will be completely on web apps, some will still stay on Microsoft Access. The next reason why you want to migrate to SQL Server is in addition to the uh, amount of users and stability. And the best reason why is security. Um, I've walked into countless places where store, they store Microsoft Access and sensitive information, financial information on an access database, social security numbers, credit card numbers. It's just, it's just uh, I've, I've seen it so, so many times. I warned the customers that you cannot have HIPAA data or sensitive security information in the pure access database. This is just not secure enough. I can walk off out of this uh, you know, network with it on a thumb drive and you would know, you would know that you would know that I left with it. And, um, you know, it's embarrassing if it gets out that um, your customers got hacked because of uh, what, what, because the data you stored insecurely. And so I tell customers, uh, look, I want to keep you out of the news. And you really need to, uh, you really need to invest in SQL Server security to avoid. Now, I'm not saying SQL Server security is impenetrable and the end of be all because obviously there's always ways to get around that as well. But, you know, it makes it a lot more difficult for a hacker to uh, hack it. When you have an access, pure access system with social security addresses, secure social security numbers, home addresses, phone numbers, name, what was your first pet at answer? Right? Hackers have a name for that. They call it a honeypot because hackers are like bees attracted to honey. And so when you have uh, a system like that, uh, you, you created a honeypot, and everybody and anybody who comes across that would just love selling that information on the dark web. And uh, you don't want to be in the news, right? I tell my customers. Now, it used to be that uh, when you hear a company uh, in the news, oh, you no know, Target got hacked, and thousands of people's information was released in the dark dark web, it used to be a big deal. I think people now have become more desensitized to that kind of thing, that kind of thing. And um, now it's just like, uh, uh, you know, well, we, you know, it's just another day in the office, right? Somebody got to tell me something. I mean, even the credit card agencies, right? Credit, I mean, not credit cards, the credit rating agencies uh, a few years back got hacked. Uh, Equifax or one of them got hacked. 
And, uh, you know, if those guys got hacked, it's just uh, who's not who's not going to get hacked, right? So it's a question of not uh, if you're going to get hacked, but when you're going to get hacked. So you got to be careful about that. You got to be ready for that. Now, um, my, my nice thing about the Azure SQL Service, let's talk about the Azure SQL Service because uh, I had this conversation with a client recently who's considering about moving to Azure. And he add, they asked me about backups. And the Azure service, if you haven't, if you want to research this, you're welcome to. It backs up to a minute. You can restore data one minute ago. I mean, it's really marvelous what they've had done. They've, they've, they've configured that. Now, the Azure SQL service is built on SQL Server. And so you, you will use SQL Server Management Systems, uh, SQL Server Management Studio, excuse me to add tables, query reviews, uh, manage your database. But it's built on SQL Server, the back end. The only thing is you don't have to worry about patches. You don't have to worry about um, memory leaks. You don't have to worry about memory configurations or anything like that. It's all handled for you automatically. And the latest Azure SQL Service is built on SQL Server 2019. And that version is probably one of the better versions that have come out. I'll tell you why, because it is as proactive in adding indexes to your database. Like I'll get an email from Azure that says, hey, by the way, you notice that if you is, um, could use this index, we went ahead and added it for you. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, that stuff I used to do before. I used to, I mean, I have a SQL certified SQL server DBA on staff. And that's how her job is, is that go through my client's databases month after month and optimize them and add indexes. And so, uh, you know, if you're, if you're using the Azure SQL service, it really is, um, really is pretty neat because it does optimize considerably for you. Now, uh, one thing about that is you're getting the latest and greatest features. You also might get the latest and greatest bugs as well, as we all know. One of my recommendations uh, is to make sure you're not on the current channel, Microsoft Office, but rather you're on a semi-annual channel for mission critical enterprise systems. You gotta be careful, right, about uh, being with channel in Office. But you no, know, and when it comes to Azure Statistical Service, I've, I've only had one time it went down in the last three years. I've been using it, so that's uh, they've got a really good track record. That's because the data center went down in Texas. And it was offline for a couple of days, and it was uh, terrible for my clients and myself. But uh, we lived through it, and uh, we learned from that. And now, what we've been, what we we're thinking about doing is, is a high-end solution where we've got a uh, pool established in one data center in Texas, Texas, for example, and then we have a second pool, a SQL Server in Chicago, and we're configuring it to. They both write to each other, right? So when a record gets committed in Texas, it gets committed in Chicago. And if the Texas data center goes down, this one picks up automatically. Well, you know, Microsoft Access uses link tables. I mean, it doesn't know. It just it uses this link table and it's using a URL, right? Uh, Windows.us.com, whatever Azure uses a U, as a UNC path. And uh, one of the challenges we're having in configuring this environment of two pools is you've got a interface between the two of them that's directing traffic, a third interface that's directing traffic. So when this data center goes down, it immediately switches over to this data center and then when the center comes back up, it switches back to this data center. And what we want to make sure is the experience is seamless for our clients around the world. So we're in the process of figuring out that out, and it's going to cost us more money, but we host so many people's data now. It's just uh, behooves us to make sure that if the data center goes down, it um, it gets picked up automatically on another one. So we're in the process of figuring all that out. It's a pretty nifty project here at IT Impact. So when it comes to convincing people to move the SQL Server, it's really worth it. At the end of the day, it's really worth it. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it could take some time. Um, but it uh, allows you so many uh, benefits and upsides. I was uh, working on, uh, I'm working on a new proposal for a client in DC, early in DC. And um, 
and um, they are really excited, you know, because you know I'm, I'm good at selling. I mean, there's a reason why I've got the one of the largest uh, Microsoft Access practices in the world with employees on four continents is because you know I'm really good at selling. I have a sales department, I have a sales manager, I got sales staff. I train them on the on the Soto method of selling, right? But um, what was my point here? I was getting to a point. Oh yes, the classic the customer tells me, "Well, that all sounds great." And then I hit him up with the following: "I said, look, once you have your data in the cloud, that opens the possibility to all these other things, right? So there's some there's some additional benefits that you need to be aware of." And well, what are they one? He does. Well, what are they one? He like leans in. I can see him leaning in. He says, "Well." A lot of our Axe developers are web developers, and we can modify your website so your client can log in and uh, submit orders, view information, open your orders, uh, download. Uh, in this case, he does. Uh, he has a work product that he uploads to the web, and he go download. And I mean, he, he ate it up. He just loved it. Said, and I have specific examples of that that I use when I'm doing the sales pitch. It says, look at this, look at that, and say, oh yeah, that's great, that's great, right? It's great. How much is all this going to cost me, right? That's the next question. And I tell them that's the wrong question. You shouldn't say how much all this is going to cost you. You just say how much is this going to save me? You should be asking me that, right? Because we're going to make you more productive, more efficient. We will do more of the same amount of people. Uh, and I always hit them up with my my line of in theory, I'm, I'm an expense on your, on your accounting books, right? I'm a vendor. I submit invoices and I go into accounts, accounts payable and your book. And if you look at your books, I'm an expense, right? I can't buy expense book. The way I see myself is as a revenue center for your business where I'm going to improve productivity. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real, literally change your lives when it comes to uh, Microsoft Access and how you use it. Then how it works and how much better it's going to be. And uh, you're going to see over time that we've saved you so much money, so much effort that you're going to continue to ask us to do things. And uh, that's one of the one of the things that we want to we want to hold you back on because you know we want to finish phase one before we go start thinking about phase two and phase three. But you know they love what they see in phase one. They already start thinking about what well, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Yes, yes, we can. But let's finish phase one. So those are the um, reasons why you want to. I'm going to go to SQL Server. I see some there's some questions here in the chat. I'd like to address them. And um, sometimes I'm chatting away and I see these questions here. My, army, my argument is always is the DSGVO are problem, which can be solved in via temporal tables. This is from Klaus. And DSV, DSGVO stands for oh, GDPR. All right, so GDPR is the European standard for privacy, right? And it's much, very strict. And yeah, and that's why the reasons why every time you go to a website in the US, they ask you, you want to accept all cookies because of GDPR. Because US companies, I've heard this and haven't, haven't, haven't had any specific examples, but US companies can be sued if they violate GDPR by GDPR by European countries. Can you cover cost of server operating system costs, backups, all extra costs, hidden costs? That's from David. David's a great question. Yeah, you know, when it comes to, um, I talked about getting the server, $1,000 server, obviously, $1,000 server is only going to be only going to take you so much. But one of the, uh, the other day I was having a customer who was buying a service for server for um, their firm, and they wanted to know how much memory they get. And they're using SQL Server Express. Now, if you use SQL Server Express, and I've mentioned this many times before, what's the amount of RAM that that SQL Server Express will use on a server? Does anybody know the answer? Anybody? One gig. You can have a 20 gigabyte RAM in that server, and SQL Server Express is only going to use one gig of that RAM and one core. So if you get a 16 core SQL Server, it's only going to use one core of that server. And even 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 with those severe, because Microsoft wants you to buy a SQL Server, right? They're not dumb. They're giving you the free SQL Server Express to get a taste, and then they want you to go and buy the full license, right? 
But even with those severe limitations, it's still running circles around access, right? It's still worthwhile. I got a lot of customers who've migrated to SQL Server Express and they've stayed on SQL Server Express for many years. I got a 20, I've had a customer for 20 years now and been on SQL Server Express. They were happy as can be. Uh, so uh, that's, there's no cost for that, right? Other than the server cost. And let's talk about backups. There is a uh, product that we recommend, SQL Server Backup and FTP that you can use to configure automated backups a single server. That's $35. And we tell people, go. Well, we actually give them the URL so that we get to make a little small commission on it. We give them a URL and they go and they, they uh, buy that product and it allows them to back up their database to the cloud, to um, to OneDrive and so forth. It's really good because it emails you if there's a failure of the backup and it's really easy to restore. It's just really nice. So that's that cost, right? And then the, 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 a lot of people get free OneDrive these days, right? A lot of people Office 365 to get free OneDrive. I still haven't run out of space on my OneDrive. Uh, and the, you know, I do project having to buy space at one point because we get more and more files over time. But uh, you can back up your server to OneDrive and it's not like there is no expense about that. About that. All right, uh, so thank you for that, uh, David, question. False it says uh, Blazor with Maui would be a good replacement of Access, I bet. We've seen other initiatives. Why would Blazor with Maui, Ma, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, M A U I be different? And then George says he's got client uh, with SQL Server Express for years. Does anybody know what the Klaus, Klaus, what do you mean by Blazor with Maui? Oh, wait a second. We're getting the URL here. Uh, what I mean is, uh, Blazor, opposite to to Power Apps, is a um, programming system where you can program uh, totally in C sharp and .NET and .NET Core, especially. And it seems um, the thing which is easiest and which is uh, most um, native to access or most similar to access. You have subforms, you have anything is similar beside the language, which is C-sharp, which is good because uh, the .NET classes, um, you have a lot of, uh, which you don't have in, in others, other things. Additionally, if you want, you can add uh, JavaScript as well, but you don't need to. It's it's a learning curve is steep. I'm 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 on the beginning of it, but uh, I think it's worthwhile. My thinking, okay. um, I'm I'm thinking of uh, a special program which at least does uh, the forms of access convert to uh, to Blazor. That would now because, is, so Blazor allows you to do full lifecycle yes. applications as opposed to Power Apps. This guy's limitations. Correct, Klaus. Blazor is looks like your Klaus. We have lost Klaus. He's on mute here. All right, something I might have to look into. We just finished a major Power App project for a customer of ours in uh, Hawaii, where they're using that to uh, enter uh, estimates for what projects are going to be completed. A large electrical contractor, and uh, I like the way it worked out because it's a very short blast. You're there. I can see you now. There he is. Yeah, no, <laughs> I've um, just. Uh... Opened my video. I don't like that because I, I don't look that funny. So I don't think I'm so interesting. But but that uh, is is interesting. That that blazer is more interesting than Power Apps. Of course, Microsoft Power Powers Power Apps and Power. Uh, I say Power Star more uh, than Blazor. But Blazor, on the other hand, is you, you don't need some separate licenses for it. It's it's uh, open source. It's Microsoft open source. It's founded and and it's it's uh, uh, programmed by Microsoft, but it's open source. And uh, like Visual Studio, um, the half of of the new uh, features come from the uh, from the folks itself. So even if Microsoft thinks like Access, no, I am no, in, I'm no, not interested any longer. 
then you still have that open source thing and and can be uh, used by the cloud. Well, so I I have a question about this, and this is more theoretical. This is George. Hi, we George. have seen attempts to do this or to do something like this before. I forget the name of the little application. Silver light. Silver light. You might, you Silver light and there was or, another one. And uh, they came light. and went. So what is light, what light kind switch. of staying power? I'm sorry? You mean light switch? Light switch, light yes. Switch, the, yeah. the light switch and silver light and some other thing. Why would this blazer have more staying power? What What is your uh, I mean, I'm not I do, question. I do access not very long, just for 20 years now. Or a little bit longer um, and I see all the customers go start with a form and not with a table they should start with a table but everybody starts with the form and the form is the most important thing and life switch was was dead uh, at the moment where you couldn't do easy forms but laser is form driven as well and that's the, the major difference, I think. Well, and again, I'm, I, I think we're kind of getting a little bit off, off the, the main topic. But in my experience, the major problems I have seen as a consultant come from people who build forms first and then think about tables later. How do you create a relational database application that way? You're right. Um, that, that's why I'm uh, a consultant, too. And uh, I take the database and I change it afterwards. But but the the form stays. Okay. okay. Even, even even if I uh, change the underlying table, the, the form which the customer had did with much um, sweat on on his uh, face, uh, this stays because he's proud of that form. Well, it's not just that he's proud of it. He he knows how his business runs. And yeah, that was designed. Uh, yeah, I, okay. Yes. I, like I say I think we're kind of veering off from Juan's main thrust, but I, when I saw that, <laughs> I, thought, I immediately thought of light switch and a couple of others. No, no uh, light switch has no went. forms, yeah. which you can do. That was, right. uh, and so far it was, uh, how you call it, debt, debt before arrival or so. It was, yeah, it, yeah, it, it was, it was a, a dead born child. At least, because if you can't do forms or reports or such things, customer won't accept it. At least in, in, in Europe or in Germany. Or <coughs> and and for for reports, um, I would use uh, the reporting engine from SQL Server because, of course, I always have the backend uh, SQL Server if I save laser with Maui. What does Maui stand use, for? Um, Maui is, oh, if if you want to um, general <coughs> programming, uh, if you look that article, <coughs> you will find an explanation on it. It's it's uh, okay. I have done a rather deep dive on it. Okay, so I do this in my own group too. I get sidetracked and get down these these side paths, but I'll, I'll yeah. stop. Yeah. No worries. All right. Thank you, Klaus, for that. Does anybody else have, uh, well, David's got another question for me. Preference or thoughts on VBMS tools, Navicat or DB4, as you stay with SQL Server? I stay with SQL Server Management Studio. I mean, I know there is a lot of other tools out there, um, but me I, too. I love SQL Server Management Studio. Me too. And do you ever use MySQL or where's the SQL Server? No, I always use SQL Server. I know we've had some inquiries over the years of clients who want to use MySQL, especially when it comes to the licensing aspect of it. Uh, but uh, there are some concerns that there's some issues with MySQL. And Ben Clothier may have written about that. You may want to search our website, accessexperts.com, for that blog post. All right. Oh, These are good questions, David. Thank you so much. Not so late as uh, here in Germany, I think. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, no, Klaus, we all know that you, you're it's, it's probably uh, three or four in the morning there. A quarter past two in the morning. Quarter past two. Well, Klaus, do you not sleep? Is that the thing where you, as you get older, you're not, you're sleeping less? <laughs> I'm sleeping in the morning, to be honest. Uh, okay, no wonder. Yeah. 
So not not before ten o'clock in the morning. Does anybody else have any questions, comments? They like to or any yeah, any, I, I any think... problems with access? You, you really should uh, say about the, in, in SQLs over the uh, temporal tables, that's an, a huge argument for, for going to SQLs over. It's my main argument. Each customer in Germany, when I say, look, you can have uh, for your, uh, the, uh, how, how, how you call it, GDPR problem, you can use, uh, temporal tables and they don't cost you anything because they they are native uh, in the SQL so even in the uh in, in the express edition uh th then I'm bought so okay. that's well yeah, I, mean, I think that'll be a good topic for next month temporal temporary tables let's go yeah. and talk about that next month for next month session thank you and for the idea I can give you the the three I have done three uh, stored procedures well, uh, which does that all? So, uh, can help you with that. Good. Yeah, yeah. Let's do yeah, that. Let's, let's talk about that next month. Yeah. yeah, configuring temporal tables would be a good one. Yeah. Speaking of next month in February, I think we have a you have a special guest next month, right, George? For your chat, for your uh, for your specific. Yes. Specific. Yeah, my special guest is none other than Juan Soto. So please join <laughs> us for that. And what is the topic yeah. we said we agreed upon? Oh, shoot. There were three security, um, security optimization. And I forget the third one. From my personal perspective, I thought I'd rather see security. But I think for the general interest, probably optimization is the question that comes up that comes up more. Just how do you make it work? Well, uh, you know, all right, with, with a SQL server back end. So 630 Pacific time would be uh, one, one thirty. One thirty in the morning next day. So eight thirty in Chicago, which would make it uh, ten thirty here in Puerto Rico. So next month I'll be uh, I'll be uh, working here starting at ten thirty at night. But I'm looking forward to it. That chat. I, um, yeah. It's a new chapter. X Pacific is a new chapter. It's been a huge success. How many people are you getting on average over there, George? Oh, we. It depends on the speaker. We generally get six, seven, eight. Um, but right. Brett, who, Brett, who was on earlier here, also joins our group because he's li located down in Brisbane. And okay, we, get, we get a couple of people from New Zealand and up and down the West Coast, depending on time. But, you know, we're nice. We're, nice. Well, looking I, forward to yeah. looking that forward to next month forward there. To yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to throw in a little plug for that. I'm saying, you know, um, one of the things that I have noticed is that the quality of my presentations has improved over the as I've learned how to do this better. <laughs> so now, from, so now, Juan has to up the game a little higher, and then the next month we got to keep moving it up because, uh, you know, we're getting, we are getting noticed, and that's that means nice. Yeah, no more. Uh, I, I call it the pizza and schmoozing type meetings. We can't do that. <laughs> All right. David's got one question the, for you. I'm sorry. The, the David's question, got one more question for us. Um, last I question. never had uh, any problems with the uh, Windows 10 or 11. I have no other uh, uh, operating system on most clients. They all use uh, Windows 10 or 11. With there that. you go. I, I agree. I agree. There's not. I mean, you could run some service, but it's not a PC, right? Customers oh, yeah. want to buy a server. I tell them, let's get a PC in Best Buy. And just let yeah. it in the corner and run SQL Server Express, and that works for the two. Yeah, I if, you have, yeah. If, if you have not very much people, like five, five or ten, it's absolutely enough. If you have a, yeah, you call it server, but if it's just a client, uh, which which runs, uh, twenty four hours. Yeah, I ran I ran a small office when I was still I, I retired, so I'm this is all in the past, but. We had, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six computers on a peer-to-peer -peer network. One of them was, you know, designated as the server, and that's where SQL Server Express was installed. Um, and it was right. more than adequate to handle their needs. And, wow. Yeah. Very nice. And also, and also, we also set up the Washington State Sports 
uh, what is that called? SSL, whatever, Sports Science Lab. And it's the same thing. They have a Windows 10 computer with SQL Server Express. But of course, they're in the university, so they have the network, you know, the, the Windows network, but otherwise it, it, it works fine. I think the, 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 mm, sorry. I'm going to say they store all the data from their from their lab tests, hundreds of thousands of records of lab data. I see. That, you know. Wow. I, the last time I looked, their website looks the same, so I don't think they've changed anything <laughs> in, in nine years. Wow. That's it. All right. Well, that's it for us, guys. I appreciate you coming out every uh, month, one, month one, after month. One, one yes. thing to the uh, Windows 10 or 11. The, the most important thing for an SQL server is, I think, uh, especially express that you have an SSD and not a normal uh, disk or an old disk. Most computers, I think, SSD. these days have SSD. I think that's a very bad, that is a good observation. The other aspect yeah. of this is that I, I said, you know, SQL Server Express uses one gig of RAM. I actually do know as a performance improvement, a service that if you know, if you, uh, 10 gigabyte versus 20 gigabyte versus 40 gigabyte, the more RAM you have, I have seen a better response to SQL Server Express. So there is that. So that's why I tell people if you can afford a $5,000 server or a $10,000 server, that's what you should get because it, uh, I, do, I do see differences. Hey, I got to run. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been Juan Soto and the SQL Server with Access chapter. Please join us next month in February. We're going to be uh, talking about temporal tables and how do you avoid the temporal rift. And how do we deal with when you go back in time and you cure your grandfather, you stay alive in your current timeline. So all that coming next month when we talk about temporal tables. So long from Puerto Rico, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, George, uh, when yes. is your meeting? We meet the first Thursday of the month at 6.30 Pacific. Oh. First Thursday of the Can month, 6.30 Pacific. First Thursday of the month, so whatever the first Thursday of February you is. Just send me uh, an email that I don't forget it. Can you drop your email address in the chat? Yes, yeah, he did. I have. Did. Oh, I see. Okay, it just popped in. Okay, yeah. I certainly will. I'll add you Thanks to the George. List. Thank you. Thanks Good a night. lot. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, so long. <laughs> so long. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.